Uh, I'm looking forward to actually sharing with you today uh, some insights and experiences that I have at applying play and games uh, to serious health issues. So not serious games, but serious health issues. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is not games for wellness, not you know uh, zombie run, uh, but really serious issues. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we create digital medicine and the processes that we use as we're looking at kind of bringing together these worlds uh, that Tusi actually talked about of entertainment. Uh, into actual healthcare and real healthcare design. Uh, I'm going to go over a quick case study of the first ever FDA, US FDA approved digital therapy. Uh, this was approved in September of 2017 uh, with a company that I and my colleague Walter Greenleaf helped to start in 2013 called Pair Therapeutics. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that and then how we actually bring these best practices uh, and design to healthcare, and how do you change and shift when you're working in a regulated world? And these things really don't go together. They're really kind of, you know, uh, polar opposites of, of how we look at these worlds. So just getting into this, why would we apply play and games to serious health issues? For me, it's really, you know, there's this increasing crisis of chronic behaviorally driven health issues. And the systems that we have to address these are not addressing it efficaciously. They're not addressing it effectively. It's not cost effective. And in a lot of cases, while there are great systems and therapeutics, they're not scalable and, and, they're, and they're not they're not working. Uh, a lot of mental and behavioral health issues can actually be seen and framed as learning disorders or maladaptive behavior. Uh, and we'll get into that. And so applying a lot of what, what Tusi talked about, about you know, great learning dynamics can actually apply to healthcare. Uh, and that's why this is so, uh, such an interesting opportunity to kind of bring these worlds together. Because of all these crises, one of the things that I've long advocated, and I've actually been an advocate for you know, uh, applying games uh, and game theory to, uh, to learning for a long time, um, but digital therapies actually can apply uh, you know, true medical value uh, in this area. Uh, there's a huge unmet need, and I'm going to talk about this unmet need uh, you know, again and again uh, in my talk here today. Um, the U.S. spends about $1.3 trillion a year on just CNS disorders. Uh, up to 80% of the world market is either unserved or underserved, and I'll get a little bit more into why that is and what that looks like uh, from, uh, from a therapeutic perspective. Uh, there are a few new drug therapies, especially in mental and behavioral health. And when I talk CNS, I'm talking psychiatry, neurology, and pain. Uh, and there, there's just a dearth in a, in a CNS pipeline from a pharmacotherapy perspective. Uh, kind of famously, last year, uh, Pfizer decided to completely divest uh, of its CNS franchises, right? So, you know, huge pharma company saying, we're no longer in that space. We're just getting out. They, they decided it was... Um, not uh, financially viable for them. Um, there's been a number of things that have kind of driven a, a world of favorable reimbursement for these types of things, both as clinicians actually getting reimbursed for reading and interacting with digital therapies, uh, as well as payers being willing to pay them. Um, so here I have the Affordable Care Act. These are things coming out of the US Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Uh, and so regardless of whatever is happening in Washington or in, your, uh, or in, or in you know, Ottawa, uh, in Canada, one thing is certain is that the train has left the station for payers. Uh, payers are really understanding that addressing these mental and behavioral health issues and addressing them early uh, at the end of the day is highly beneficial to them. So regardless of what happens, it changes in Washington, like I said, or, or, go or governmental changes, there is going to continue to be favorable reimbursement for integrating and working within these healthcare systems, the, these digital therapies. And finally, and I'm going to talk a lot about data, and you know, I know we've got some speakers who are speaking specifically about data and the power of data, um, but these, these software-based therapies have been shown to be efficacious. Uh, they've shown to work, uh, and, and these are being brought through the same rigors of clinical trials, randomized controlled trials, uh, that we would for a pharmacotherapy or a medical device. Uh, so being brought through the same systems, we're seeing uh, as good or better outcomes with digital therapies. 
So what are we looking to address with our digital therapies and games in healthcare? Um, there's a growing um, uh, a burden of non-communicable diseases, and it's the fastest growing cause of death and disability around the world. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the good news and the bad news of non-communicable non disease is that uh, people are actually living longer with these, right? And, and so, you know, people will actually have these long-term chronic diseases um, that, uh, you know, are, are actually increasing the burden, the global cost burden. This is a WHO uh, figure is $47 trillion for these diseases. And there are very few uh, F efficacious therapies and treatments uh, to address these. Um, there's actually a decreasing life expectancy because of these. In the U.S., uh, working class white men have actually seen a decrease in life expectancy because of, of behaviorally oriented diseases and non-communicable diseases. The other thing that's actually interesting about this, and I'm going to talk more about mental health because that, we've been focusing at paratherapeutics on the mental and behavioral health side, is that even viral disease can actually be rooted to behavioral causes. Uh, and the reset therapeutic that I'll present today is for addiction um, management, uh, substance use disorder, and opioid use disorder. Uh, and so there's clear ties between that behavior and uh, viral diseases like hep C and HIV. Uh, so when we, when we look at the, the, the burdens here, they're just profound. In the CNS spectrum, uh, you can see similar burdens, you know, trillions of dollars uh, and, and worldwide. So the 80% of the world market for uh, mental and behavioral health um, is, is at 20% served uh, in, in other parts of the world. So this is in our, in our developed world here. We're only serving about 20% 20, 20 efficaciously. Uh, in other parts of the world, uh, it's even more dire. Um, on the subcontinent of India, there's kind of Famously, if not infamously, for the billion people there, about 4,000 psychiatrists. Talk about a waiting line, right? You know, talk about a delay in services and need. And again, I'll talk about addiction. You know, there's a huge need here. Uh, the cost and consequences of mental illness and addiction are just phenomenal. Uh, and when we talk about disability adjusted life years, if we add mental health disorders with our neurological conditions, we're looking at over 20% of cost burdens. Uh, and, and again, not a lot of scalable, affordable, viable, available therapies uh, to be able to provide to people. But there are treatments, right? And in the real world, these treatments require expert framing and education, right? And this is where the e-learning and education part comes in. Uh, we actually frame a lot of uh, these disorders as, as they require this kind of education. Uh, they require intensive coaching and, and attention to the patient. They can often require 24-7 access uh, and support. And we see this, again, in addiction management, where, where patients will be put in a 30-day treatment center where they're removed in, in this 24-7 access. Again, not viable or scalable for a lot of these things. Uh, a lot of the issues in the real world when we're trying to apply these therapies is that they're expensive. Uh, in San Francisco, where I'm from, the average cost of a therapist is around $200. Uh, in New York City, it's $300. Um, it's not scalable. We, we can't all afford to have our own therapist sitting next to us and talking de next to us. And the, and the people who are actually in most need can least afford this. Uh, in, in no small part because there are all kinds of friction points that are incorporated and embedded into to traditional delivery of, of health care. Um, you know, if I need to go across town to see my therapist, I need to leave work early, I may need to get, you know, child care, I may need to take three buses to get there or pay for an Uber. Uh, finally, uh, in the real world, there's a lack of specialists. Um, you know, I talked about you know the, India and their 4,000 psychiatrists. In the United States, the American uh, uh, Pain Society suggests that there's one qualified pain clinician, one qualified pain medicine doctor, for every 10,000 patients in need that has chronic pain. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's, a, there's a, just a, a lack of, uh, of, of, of skilled specialists in these areas. 
So what we're looking to address uh, when we apply games and, and digital interventions uh, to, uh, to healthcare are really a couple different areas. Uh, and in the work that, that I'm doing, we really focus a lot on neuroplasticity. Uh, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit about, again, you know, neuroplasticity can have a bit of a double-edged sword. It can actually cause people to have this maladaptive uh, and learning disorder uh, that causes them to kind of be down one path. But, you know, the beauty of neuroplasticity city is we can change minds and by changing minds we can change brains and we can change lives. Uh, in a traditional world, in our traditional world, um, you know, the, this, the, the best approaches, the gold standard uh, is, and you see we have a little uh, couch-based system here where you know, you're talking on the couch, uh, spending a lot of couch time with your therapist. You may combine this with uh, you know, chemical agent, right? So in, in, consider like major depressive disorder. Um, you've got your talk therapy, your SSRI or antidepressant, and that's the gold standard. Similarly, with behavior modification, right? So we look at cognitive training, again, an education framework, uh, activation uh, that is actually really critical here is we're, we're looking for activation. Uh, and this is the gold standard of care. And I, and I want to talk a, a little bit here because as I'm going to jump right into the games and how games apply here. Um, but activation is actually really important and uh, because actions can actually adjust neurochemistry. Uh, there's a couple of different theories uh, from neuroscience. One is the facial formation theory. Are people familiar with facial formation therapy and theory? This is the theory that if you smile, and even, and they've done tests with this with just making people hold a pencil in their mouth so that their cheeks turn up, um, that you will actually report uh, a better mood after this, right? So fake it till you make it, you know? It works, it actually works. Um, and, and it's actually interesting because our brains will actually adjust based on this. Not only our brains, our bodies. I work with a startup in San Francisco, actually originally out of Singapore, uh, that has a blood pressure device. Uh, it, it uses cryotherapy on the carotid artery. And, over, and, and it dro naturally drops non-pharmacological intervention for high blood pressure, um, for hypertension, and it naturally drops the blood pressure uh, after a therapeutic approach. After six weeks of this cryotherapy, people are actually, their body just resets. So this plasticity actually works not only in the brain, but in the body as well. So we know this works. There's, you know, there's, there's great proof um, that, that this can work. And again, here's some of the proof. Um, you know, it, we've actually, there's a number of trials. Actually, um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Greenleaf, uh, and I actually are just about to publish a book chapter in a medical textbook on uh, digital therapeutics for chronic pain. We reviewed literally hundreds of studies that have been done over the years, going back over 20 years, looking at the efficacy of internet-driven therapies and games in healthcare, and, and I, I can tell you they work. Uh, what I have here is we're looking at, you know, uh, internet interventions for depression and anxiety. Uh, I was talking with some colleagues over here earlier about applying this to kids. You know, when we look at these digital natives, uh, in Australia, our colleagues there found that using sparks for teens with um, mild to moderate depression depression. Uh, th this is a, a highly immersive and interactive game. Uh, they actually had greater improvements than treatment as usual. And, and this makes sense. These kids are digital natives. They know how to work in this environment. They're teenagers, so there's a little bit of a natural distrust of adults. Uh, but when they're engaging and interacting with their avatar, they just have better outcomes. Uh, and, and actually, this is interesting. Uh, who's heard of NeuroRacer? Has anybody heard of NeuroRacer? Walter. Um, NeuroRacer was a game that was developed uh, by a colleague of ours, Adam Ghazali, uh, at UCSF and spun out to uh, now a for-profit company uh, called Akili. Uh, and NeuroRacer, when, it was, when the studies came out, um, you know, people were applauding. Obviously, it made the cover of Nature, uh, but people were applauding that if this was a drug, it'd be a billion-dollar drug. Uh, the improvements in memory, attention, and cognitive function were profound with this. So, so these things are really exciting. Uh, we have a lot of uh, you know, venture investors excited about this uh, and, and I think a lot of medical professionals as well. So why games though? Why and how does it work? 
we get patients actively involved, right? You know, when you consider like the, the you know, moving from novels to theater to film, right? One is a lean back, right? We've got these lean back systems, but games are lean in, you know? We get people involved in their therapy, in their experience, uh, and they actually will spend more time in their own self-care. There's immediate and direct feedback, right? And for a lot of these things that are their chronic and relapsing disorders, we need that kind of immediate feedback. Feedback is so pertinent here because our bodies are actually tuned to feedback, right? And so if I'm trying to actually get somebody to um, modify their eating you, and, and then, you know, I want to offer them, you know, wh what am I going to offer them? I'm going to offer you advice that the cookie is bad and the kale salad is good. But we know intuitively that the cookie is good, right? And it's got sugar and fat, and our bodies are actually tuned to that and tied to that. So that cookie offers an immediate reward and feedback that the kale really doesn't, right? That kale is going to be, mm, you know, and you know it's good for you. But how can we actually layer on with a game system additional rewards that actually e equate the cookie to the kale or even make the kale more rewarding, right? And so this is one of the things that games can do uh, and give us. It, it can make it actually even more rewarding than the negative behavior that we're trying to replace. Uh, increasingly motivating, uh, and again, you know, and so with contingency management, this is like a reward system that I was talking about, and there's been a number of studies. Uh, we have colleagues at UConn in Connecticut, on, uh, a, a group of over 26 uh, PhD researchers that have been focusing on contingency management, led by Dr. Nancy Petrie there, uh, for a number of years to see how these kinds of games and rewards can actually modify and motivate uh, positive behavioral change. Games provide social connections, uh, you know, we, and we look at actually getting whole families involved, uh, not only families, but, you know, uh, what we call kind of weak social ties. Uh, and there's been some really interesting uh, work done at MIT uh, by um, uh, Sandy Pentland and his Human Behavior Lab looking at a concept called social physics. And in social physics, so in contingency management, if I do well and am abiding by and adhering to my therapy, I get a reward. Reward. You know, and this may be a, an intrinsic reward, an attaboy, a recognition, or it may be an extrinsic reward. I could get a, you know, a Starbucks gift card or, you know, out here, a Tim Hortons card, right? You know, where we, we get some rewards and physical. In social physics, we actually put together small groups um, that uh, have related issues and concerns. And, uh, and then we reward the group based on the group behavior and the group dynamic. So if the three of us were involved in a group uh, and we were all got rewarded for going for a run, I would make sure, it, and I got rewarded when you went for a run and you went for a run, I would make sure that you were going for your run every day. And you would actually be more highly motivated, right? We're much more likely to disappoint ourselves than to disappoint others. Uh, and, and so it's actually, you know, a really, really interesting. Sandy and his team actually have rolled this out in, uh, in Brazil, in Africa, and trying to get people to immunize their children, right? And in those cases, um, the, the social physics suggests that, you know, if I bring my child, my baby in to be immunized, I get a bag of beans, and when you bring your child in, I get a bag of rice. So I am walking you to that clinic so that I get that bag of rice as well. And I'm going to talk a lot about uh, dose response when I get down into how we're actually modifying and moderating our games to make them more game-like, more efficacious. Uh, because the more we interact with behavioral interventions, the better our outcomes uh, in, in large part, right? You know, it's, it's diet and exercise. I can't just diet today. I need to diet for the rest of my life, right? Uh, so, you know, what we're looking here is how do we keep people engaged via this dosing? Again, going back to something Tusi talked about, games are important because we tap into these emotional drivers. Uh, in traditional uh, healthcare, you know, we're we're largely motivating by um, logic and fear, uh, and we know that this doesn't work. In 1859, Florence Nightingale said that, you know, apprehension and fear are the worst things for patients. They, they do a patient more harm than any exertion, right? So we've known this for a long time, uh, and yet we haven't really effectively addressed how we uh, tap into emotions when it comes to healthcare. 
Uh, and again, Tusi, you, you perfectly set me up. Um, so, you know, what we look to do in games is to bring in um, the emotional drivers from Hollywood, as well as Las Vegas. One of the things I like to say is Hollywood knows how to sway our emotions, and Las Vegas knows how to motivate us. Right? You know, if you've ever gone to Las Vegas and you see these people pulling slot machines, you know that they've got some sort of power that the doctor doesn't. You know, that we can get this kind of repetitive behavior going on and on and on. And this is what we're looking to kind of embed in, in our games. And the reason for this is that we are neurologically wired for story. And the reason that, that you know, when I talk about games, it makes sense that Vegas is there, but why Hollywood? And it's exactly this. Research shows that when we, when we convert facts into a story, we actually have improved retention, right? You know, imagine I'm telling a patient that we need to lower your blood pressure by 20 points or 20% uh, to hit this number because it'll increase your life expectancy by X. That is not memorable, right? You know, but if I say, you know, let's do this, and here's how we're going to do it, and I moderate your behavior so that you can dance at your daughter's wedding, now all of a sudden this actually has greater meaning to me. It has greater impact in my life. Story actually uh, enhances the meaning. It, it, it improves understanding, right? You know, when we, when we put things in these kind of story forms, uh, people are much more engaged with what it is. And what, one of the things that we do uh, as we're creating these, these digital health games is we look to see how every health concern can actually be applied as a story, right? So when we look at like, you know, the hero's journey where, you know, we have order and this is good health and then there's a disruption of, uh, of an inciting incident, right? Uh, and then this causes a chaos. So how do we look to apply this kind of, you know, this health as a, uh, a order, chaos, and resolution that we can apply? Uh, and it, and it's, it, it actually works. And if you, you know, I, I challenge anyone to think of a, of a health issue that we can't apply this to. Uh, because I think that we can kind of bootstrap it uh, into, uh, into just about everything. And when we do this, it actually works. Uh, has anybody here heard of uh, Remission from the Hope Labs? We got a couple of folks. So Hope Labs is a not-for-profit uh, not uh, lab in San Francisco that's looking at applying game and game theory uh, to, um, to health, to health issues. Uh, it was founded by uh, the founder of eBay's wife, Pam Amidyar, and this was the first game that they created, uh, Remission. Remission was created for pediatric cancer patients. Uh, and the thing about peds and teens is they are a perfect storm for noncompliance, right? They see their treatment as a drag. This is just a drag. This is something that's taking me away from school and friends the prom, the mall, right? They don't see this in any way of being helpful or advantageous to them that they're actually getting this type of treatment. With, with remission, we actually see that there's a reframing of the story, right? We, we recreate the story of treatment here where you know, now we're going with Roxy, the nanobot, inside the body where we are battling cancer with the weapons of chemotherapy and the body's natural response and all of the things that are in the treatment paradigm for these kids that they need to be adhering to but that they're largely not. Uh, interestingly, with this game, the game developers and designers designed 20 levels, and so this was intended to be 20 hours of play. But one of the things that they noticed is that the kids were just playing an hour, a couple hours, but we were still seeing improved outcomes. They were more adherent, and because they were more adherent to their therapies, they, they were actually having better outcomes with their cancer. Uh, and it's remarkable what, what's actually happened here so that in subsequent versions, they decide, well, we don't really need this much. We just really need this kind of reframing of the story. Uh, and, and now they're actually even looking at, you know, how long does it really take until there is the, the neurological shifts in the brain structures using functional MRI uh, and PET imaging uh, of what's happening in these kids' brains that they're enabled, you know, that they've really just kind of shifted how they think about this. Before we get into like, oh, we don't have time to create like stories uh, around this, it doesn't have to be Moby Dick or even Harry Potter, right? You know, context is storytelling. Uh, and so I want to just kind of point out here, you know, this is Donkey Kong from 1981, and this is, this is actually, you know, the game mechanic, 
right? There's, there's a, a obstacles and a, and a goal, right? Um, but when we layer on even just the smallest type of contextual elements, um, you know, we've got Kong here, uh, that is our main nemesis. Uh, actually, for anybody that remembers, uh, that's Pauline. She was like one of the first female characters in video games. Uh, and so, you know, we've got a love interest in Pauline, and we are here, Mario, you know, kind of now uh, going through the obstacles to, to uh, you know, get to our love interest. Uh, and so even though this is so simple, this is really Joseph Conrad in an 8-bit world. You know, and so we can, as we're thinking about how, you know, we layer on story here, it doesn't have to be super complex. Uh, you know, we can just make contextual layers that drive those emotions. And here's another reason why games and digital therapies work. This is the world that we live in. And when we deliver therapies to patients via their devices, this is the modern day equivalent of a house call. Right, you know, and a lot of these disorders that, that we're tackling in my work are these kind of chronic disorders, right? And you know, the crisis doesn't conveniently happen when I'm, you know, sitting in the therapist's office or sitting in the doctor's office, and these systems are available 24 7. So, what is it that we do when we create digital medicine? Number one, and again, you know, I'm going to refer back to Tootsie's, uh, Tootsie's talk this morning. Um, you know, we have to understand our patients. Uh, and then, you know, from my perspective, because I actually come from a game development and design and entertainment background perspective, I w went to film school uh, and, and then, you know, got involved in creating digital medicine. We look at agile development and how we can apply that to the healthcare world. But starting with understanding our patients. I mentioned earlier that you know, a lot of traditional medicine really applies to the left brain, right? It's, it's logic, you know, and I'm a doctor, and this is the logical thing for you to do. Uh, and, and what we really want to do is to apply to both the left and the right brain, right? And this is where our emotional drivers and draw comes in. And one of the first things that we do is start to break down the psychographics. Right, and so I'm going to actually jump into a little bit more in depth with you know what these kind of psychographics look like for healthcare patients, uh, and then uh, I'm going to run through a couple of examples of how I've done this for different uh, for different um, uh, therapies that that I've worked on or am working on. So C to B Solutions has actually done this great work, these kind of longitudinal and long-term studies on what are the drivers and psychographics for, uh, for patients, right? Uh, and interestingly here, it's a fairly even divide. It's about 40-40 with a lot of people being in the middle. One of the things that I want to point out about this, though, is that these are not fixed. Right? Patients don't you know, start off in one area and just have to absolutely stay there. That can happen, uh, but we, we're largely mobile in this, uh, in these psychographics, right? So one of the things I want to point out is most of us, when we were like in, in uni, you know, high school uni, you're strong survivors. There's more important things. You're not worried about your health, right? You know, you're too fierce for that. I remember myself feeling like I was bulletproof when I was an undergrad, right? You just aren't worried about anything. Um, and, and then you can move. Um, a key point, a uh, key inflection point that is really notable for a lot of folks in moving it through these psychographics is uh, the first time a woman gets pregnant. Uh, she may actually even jump into this kind of self-achiever phase where all of a sudden she's you know, now you know, really taking additional responsibility for her life. And one of the reasons that I want to point out that, that these are mobile psychographics, right, that we can actually move from one category to another is that a lot of times in our games we try to incite this movement. Right? I, can, I can take people who are strong survivors and, and active listeners and try and move them in a little bit more of a proactive category. Uh, and, you know, and, and, but it's just the most important thing is to understand where your patients are coming from. So in this process, you know, we, we do a breakdown of, of what are their motivators, right? And so when I look at my proactive, um, you know, I look at what her motivators are, the business indications, because I'm in a for-profit business, right? We want to know how we're actually going to be able to monetize these people as well. You know, is this a direct-to-consumer play? Will they pay for this themselves? Is this something where, you know, uh, we need to find somebody else to pay? Uh, what, what do they look for, right? You know, and then, of course, who are they? And then once we actually even have this, we get into a little bit more of an identity customer uh, that you know, goes into deeper and deeper about this person's life. 
Um, and the same for our reactive target, right? And as I said, you know, one of the things that we can consider, and I'm working on a project right now with the Mental Health Association of Maryland, where we're really actively looking at how do we get people who are reactive to become proactive. Uh, and so it's important for us to really begin to understand both of these uh, areas, right? And how, and how they're different and how they're the same. Uh, and again, you know, looking at what this uh, identity customer is, is looking like. Uh, in a more real-world example, uh, this is the psychographics that I created for a, a game, a VR-based game uh, with biofeedback that we created for chronic pain uh, patients. Uh, these patients uh, are, were on Medicaid, so government-only uh, uh, government insurance and assistance. Um, and they were uh, on average, uh, you know, 65% women. Uh, and you can see here when we're looking at their motivators, um, you know, these are largely needs-driven folks. Um, you know, and because they're on Medicaid, we, we certainly understand a lot about their socioeconomic levels, right? The, the levels at which they're coming from, their, their edu average education levels and the like. Uh, and then we, you know, as we begin to kind of delve down into this, this is the first part of game design for us. Game design for health is really understanding these folks. We want to get into, you know, who are our identity customers here, right? You know, and what what are their lives look like, right? So we can begin to really understand, you know, their their motivations, the um, the friction points, right? And so when we look at Larissa. We have Larissa here as a picture with her kids. She's a single mom. Uh, she suffers from back pain. Uh, she's got a lot of going on in her world, you know, and she's got a lot of issues. And so, you know, one of the things that we want to consider when we're creating all of these games uh, is, you know, what, what are her needs? Um, similarly with Nancy, you know, we want to look at, you know, how she's the same and different from Larissa as we're crafting this game uh, and, and the same for Jose. Uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, how can we create something that's actually going to appeal and to apply uh, to all of these folks. And we create this, like, in-depth backstory. So as we're designing these games, we know these people, right? You know, we can refer to, well, Jose won't really like that. And what can we do for Nancy in this case? And, you know, this language doesn't really appeal to Larissa, and we may need to make some adjustments there. So they become characters in our world as game designers and developers as we're developing these therapies. So this is the, really the beginning of the process, right? So we need to first understand our patients, their needs, and the desired outcomes. And one of the things I want to say about the desired outcomes, too, is that we really want to marry uh, the desired outcomes, our clinical desires and outcomes, right? I want you to lower your blood pressure. Um, like in the case of our chronic pain patients, um, these chronic pain patients were being seen frequently, and, and they were high opioid users, right? So we wanted to decrease. Uh, uh, hospital and clinic visits, and we wanted to see if we couldn't also decrease uh, opioid use amongst these patients. So these are two clear and readily, you know, uh, uh, objective measures, clinical outcome measures that we're looking to measure with this game, right? And then what? What are like Nancy, Larissa, and Jose's objectives? Well, they want to be pain free. They don't really care about decreasing their opioids. Their desire is to be pain-free, right? And so how do we kind of marry these desired outcomes with the patient's desired outcomes as well as, as clinical, clinically our desired outcomes? And then the rest of this looks like, you know, kind of more traditional uh, game design, right? You know, once we understand our patients and the kind of possibly even conflicting desired outcomes that we have as clinicians versus patients, uh, we create a game concept. The, the, the game design, and then this is a lot of what we do. And then, but you know, for us here, after data, we measure these health outcomes. You know, we measure it both from a perspective of like a, a net promoter value um, from you know the from the game user perspective, right? Do you like the game? Did you engage with it? Would you recommend it to others? Uh, do you feel that you know as a patient that this has improved your life and your etiology, your condition, uh, as well as from a clinical perspective, right? In the case of our chronic uh, chronic pain game. Did it decrease clinic use and visits? And did it decrease uh, opioid prescriptions? Uh, so it's, it, it, it layers on more complexity into what we're doing here. The challenges here as we're moving into a regulated environment, and I'm going to jump really quickly here into what we did at Pair Therapeutics is, this is a tr traditional clinical process, product design process. This is really kind of for you know, pharmacotherapy. Um, 
Tusi again kind of talked about this. This is waterfall. Right, you know, uh, this is like anathema to us as game designers because you know this is you know with a lot of planning, a lot of uh, pedantic you know feedback loops and response. Whereas you know our process in agile is just to constantly build design release, build design release, build design release. Right, so these worlds are kind of uh, not uh, congruous, very incongruous, as a matter of fact. Um, but it can be done, and that's one of the things that you know we've been able to achieve. And I've got other colleagues that are looking to do the same because uh, it's necessary. And one of the reasons that it is necessary is digital medicine, digital health it has been through this just outrageous kind of hype cycle. Um, I was at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference in San Francisco in January, and I was talking about the power of regulated health. And I said, there, you know, in the app stores alone, not including health games that are on the internet, um, there were 320,000 health games available in the app stores. And somebody from the audience yelled out, 325. So between the time I had looked it up and got there that morning, there were like another 5,000 apps that had been added. Uh, and so one of the things that actually makes it really pertinent for us to be in this regulated environment, to be data driven, is this hype cycle, right? I mean, we've seen, you know, Thanos and the Myelin, EpiPens, and, you know, a lot of things that have actually had a ton of promise, uh, but that have just, you know, not really been shown uh, to, to work. And I, I think in this next generation, we need to be just data driven. You know, we need to actually prove that these things work. We need to have the same type of rigor uh, that uh, is applied to pharmacology and, and medical device. And so we're working in the United States uh, with our uh, FDA, um, but uh, across the world, um, you know, in, in Europe, and I know here uh, there are similar regulating bodies. Uh, we actually approach this differently too, you know. So in that first kind of hype cycle that I talked about, you know, when, when Google was getting involved uh, in these early days, um, they basically kind of even said, oh, we don't need to be regulated, you know, we're going to innovate, and they came smack dab against this, uh, these, these regulating bodies. But we took a different approach. We said that these regulating bodies are actually here for a reason, right? They're here to, to wean out worthless cures, right? And of these 325,000 apps that are out there, how many of them really are just digital snake oil? You know, and so what we need to do as clinicians and game designers in this space is differentiate between that digital snake oil and work within these systems so that we're actually integrating into uh, the clinical um, uh, workflows. So in our reset case study, uh, let me tell you just a little bit about pair therapeutics. Uh, I mentioned pair earlier. We're a, a digitally integrated uh, digital therapeutics company. Um, we, in 2017, had the first FDA-approved digital therapy, which is Reset, that I'm going to be presenting. Uh, we started the company uh, by, you know, launching a subclinical app and platform in 2015. Uh, and then we decided that we really needed and wanted to go only into this regulated space. So when you look at our pipeline, we're really uh, addressing areas of high unmet medical need and really, you know, serious health issues, right? So beyond our substance use disorder and opioid disorder, uh, we have therapies for schizophrenia, uh, post-traumatic stress, generalized anxiety disorder, traumatic brain injury, insomnia. So we started with addiction, though, because this is, a, in the United States, a, a nationwide epidemic. And I know I'm, I'm, I've got just a, a little bit more time here, so I'm going to run through some of these things. Um, in 2016, 65,000 people died of a drug overdose. That's like two jumbo jets crash landing every week and killing everyone on board. And still, in many areas, there's a horrible lack of care and services, even for people who want help with their disease. Right? So this is a huge and pressing need uh, around the world. The current state of care uh, often actually has diagnosis uh, occurring way too late. Um, you know, and, and actually, one of the things I like to talk about with addiction is you know, we wait for somebody to be either arrested or overdosed in a hospital before we actually say something. That's like waiting for somebody to weigh 500 pounds before suggesting they go on a diet. And we need to actually get to them sooner. Uh, and there's inconsistent treatment. And I talked about you know, the dearth of treatment for a lot of these things. By some accounts, only 1 in 10 patients with an addiction disorder actually gets appropriate treatment. 10% of patients that have these disorders. 
And we approach it as a learning disorder, right? You know, addiction actually has roots in the word enslaved. Uh, and this is where we were talking a little bit about this neuroplasticity and, and the neuro effects of this, right, as, as a learning disorder. Um, you know, these patients become uh, tied and keyed uh, to the reward system that the drug or the alcohol provides for them. Uh, and, you know, and while they realize and understand the negative impacts, uh, their neurochemistry is just tied to that reward system. And so our success uh, requires actually reframing that reward system. So I'm just going to run through this really quickly um, because I realize I'm running out of time. The uh, uh, reset is actually based, uh, it, it is integrated into uh, clinical workflows. Um, there are a number of patient-facing modules. And, and one, one thing I want to note here, too, is as we're, we're applying this and, and approaching the FDA with this, uh, our clinical trials were based on uh, some work that came out of Dartmouth Geisel School of Innovation Medicine. And the FDA wanted to see things that were really close to the exact trial data, right? And didn't give us a lot of room to innovate. Uh, and I want to make sure I have an opportunity to talk about game innovation uh, and, and how we apply this. Uh, but a, a, a couple quick points here. So when we look at this, this is this looks more like an app, right? You know, this isn't really game. Okay, this is a game that's like a little roulette wheel where you spin the wheel. And this is kind of gamification. And it works, right? And, and this works. And I have to say, and, and you know, just kind of pointing out here, um, this actually integrates with clinician dashboards. This is a prescription-based therapy. Uh, so the clinician actually, uh, and there are CPT codes. Those are billing codes. So docs can actually bill against utilizing this and working with this. Because you know, in the US, we're moving towards capitation, but we're we're still in an accountable care, but we're still in a fee-for-service model. So we're going hand in hand with both of these. So you know, the docs can actually work with this. They can trace and track their patients. They can triage their patients with this. And our outcomes actually prove. Now, these are chronic and relapsing diseases. I don't want to say that this is a cure. Uh, but in our 12-week studies, patients that used reset versus treatment as usual had a 2x improvement. This is all comers. 2x improvement over treatment as usual. And treatment as usual in this case was three times a week with a therapist uh, and providing actually the same therapy, which is um, community uh, reinforcement approach, a flavor of cognitive behavioral therapy specifically developed for addiction disorder. I want to point out here that for the most reticent patients, these are patients that showed up on study start still high. They had a positive urine tox screen. When they started the study, we had a 10x improvement over treatment as usual. And then and the retention numbers and the p-values here for any of our stats wonks are phenomenal. We're, you know, we're just so pleased and proud of what we've been able to prove with this, right? And I, I mentioned earlier data-driven, you know, and, and data, uh, you know, uh, focused. Uh, and this actually does, in, uh, in, does actually create medical value, right? You know, there are cost savings, there are values that we can attribute to getting these patients uh, improved and healthier sooner. Uh, and we did the whole process of submitting this to the FDA. And I don't know if anybody's ever submitted anything to the FDA, but writing a de novo 510K for the US FDA was, uh, this was the e-file, I have to say. That for e-filing, they made us print it and send it in. <laughs> I think it weighed like 28 pounds. Um, so when we're looking to, uh, and, and I mentioned here that you know, we have enhanced outcomes, not only for the patients, clinicians, but as well as the payers. Just really quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, uh, I, I want to talk really about how we're looking to gamify and even enhance this. Um, so when we're looking at this process and, and then you womp on a 26-page you know, document, the FDA really has not been tuned and keyed towards a lot of rapid change, right? You know, um, the drug Lipitor uh, has been on the market for 30 years, and they haven't changed the formulary, right? So th this is not that, uh, for good reason, right? I mean, we can't actually stay in those worlds um, because in, we're in technology, uh, and for one reason, the Earth moves under our feet, right? You know, um, my, you know, if you've got an Android device, it wants to update all the time. My iOS device updates on a regular basis. By changing, we can also enhance personalization. This goes to actually scaling and reusing content, right? Via reskinning it, I can actually make something that, you know, highly appropriate using cognitive behavioral therapy for one group versus another uh, by dynamic reskinning and personalization. And I also mentioned this dose response, right? And so you, we want to enhance these games to make them more engaging and sticky for our patients. 
So how we do that is we focus on the data. Uh, we also don't make claims, you know, as we're making changes. You know, we run these things through, and then we run them through the, the, the control trials that are most pertinent. Uh, and for us, we work with our agencies uh, that will help to kind of fund these things. So in our next version of Reset, you know, we did some agile storyboards where we decided that what we're really looking at is Grand Theft Auto meets The Sims, right? And we wanted to create a really engaging and immersive world that, you know, brought to life this issue, this story arc um, that, you know, where we can reframe one story with craft. This is the community reinforcement approach. And so what we went from is an app looking uh, to much more game, and I'm just going to run through some of these screens where you can see. So, you know, we've got, from an app world, we've now got, you know, uh, options and outcomes. This is, you know, a highly immersive game world where we're looking at a holistic approach to our patients' needs and drivers and all of those emotional tugs that I was talking about earlier. So, you know, as opposed to just, you know, an, an now text on a screen, uh, we've got, you know, somebody actually entering a bar, right? And talk about refusal skills coming to life, you know? And so we're really looking to kind of bring this very much to life here. And to have these types of identity and engagement exchanges that make this all the more real for our patients. And I apologize for having to kind of run through that really quickly. Uh, I, I know that uh, we're, we'll have a panel discussion later, and, uh, and I will certainly be around uh, to answer any questions. Uh, but, but please bring your questions to our panel as well. And I'll just end it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Mm -hmm.